Okay, so we're back. I'm sorry about that brief interruption. The font was just weird. Um, now, so we looked at the modes of conceptualization or the forms of appearance of the state according to Hintze and Krasner. Now, I will add that this is probably going into the more modern um, political theory. Stephen Krasner is probably still alive and so um, this is his conceptualization of the state as government, as administrative apparatus, um, as an institutionalized legal order, or as a ruling class. And you can sort of look at this um, as all present in the American state, but also as something like a normative order. So what are the norms of the state? What do we expect the state to do? What do we expect it not um, to do? So those are uh, ways in which a state models itself. And, you know, in many cases, you actually see all of them um, together. And some will focus on, for example, the ruling class, who rules, um, what are the characteristics, those kinds of things. Um, but so you can sort of see the different conceptualizations of, um, of the state. Now, Without really going back all the way to state, to thinking about Greece, Athens, Sparta, and those uh, city-states, um, we have briefly talked about the road to statehood. So, you know, empires, principalities, duchies, electorates, kingdoms, canids, and bishoprics, and other different types of uh, states. Um, the, what we are looking at is not just the contours of the object of political rule, but sort of the philosophical um, underpinnings of what this thing is. Uh, and so we are thinking of um, issues of legitimacy. And so, for example, John Locke argues that power rests with the people and that absolutist rule is limited by mankind. The idea is that people who are especially oppressed will always find a way to throw off the yoke of oppression. Um, now, the level of oppression may be different among people. So some people might feel completely throttled and can um, have no space to express themselves. While in other places, it's sort of like, okay, that's where, that's where we live, that's what we do. Um, let me give you an example of the uh, freedom of speech. So freedom of speech is a most treasured American um, uh, precept. But if you go to countries like say Egypt or Iran during the um, this Arab Spring, even now with Iran, um, throttling of internet or just not making it available is a thing. A lot of countries do this during elections. And so this is not, um, if you speak ill of people, what here might count as insults in places like um, the UK, you could be sued for libel or, um, you know, different offenses. And so when we then think about what John Locke ultimately thinks the state is, he argues it's a beneficial institution created by rational people to protect their natural rights of interests um, and those kinds of things. And, and so this is the social contract um, that is attributed to Locke and Rousseau. So you create the rules that govern your membership in society and the punishments therein, but you also allow yourself to be bound by those rules. Um, now, of course, this is the period of kings and uh, monarchs and queens and questions of where does the authority to rule come from? And so this is legitimacy. If you think about this in the American context, the, the um, legitimacy to rule comes from um, elections. You are elected or you're not. Um, 
if your ideas outpace the other sites, even though these days ideas seem to be the last thing on our minds, then you probably uh, form government. And so the, the moral and legal right to rule that is based on custom, law, heredity, or the consent of the government. And so the states that we are talking about um, base their rule on a lot of these things, law, custom, heredity. So for example, the king, of England, we so recently take office, um, heredity. Um, whoever comes after him, his son, hopefully William, um, heredity. Um, but who runs the day-to-day -day government? Um, those to whom consent to govern has been given. Now, of course, the British are slightly different in this case because you know, if you go to Saudi Arabia, the, the, the king is also the political. Um, and so a lot of these um, legitimacy to rule issues come from sometimes long histories of perceived connectivity, so nationalism, allegiance, um, and so on. Um, are they legitimate? Sometimes we also see people denied of being able to form government or self-rule, even though they have those things like uh, common customs, cultural practices, historical and language uh, similarities. So the cards are a good example of this um, and many other different groups. But um, these days, I think most students will find that one of the most used definitions by of um, the modern state is derived from uh, Max Weber. Um, and so he articulates a number of sovereign state um, or modern state types of um, expectations and concepts and um, obligations and responsibilities. Um, and we shall look at some of them in the next few um, um, slides. So the sovereign power state sometimes is identical with the nation state, but also remember the nation state is a nation, this is a state, and this is a nation state. Um, and so sometimes they are the same. Now the state's internal structure um, can also determine what kind of state it is, as we mentioned, the many different types of states. And so liberal democratic state or non-liberal, actually there's a very interesting um, theoretical uh, paper or concept advanced by Farid Zakaria of illiberal states. So those states that do the things that liberal democracies do, and I think in, he had in mind, for example, Pakistan, you have elections, but you also have, um, you know, the use of Sharia law. So the, it's, it's a complex interwoven uh, dialogue between religion, traditions, and law, and how that is expressed in the leaders. But the state's internal structure can secure individual liberties. It doesn't always do that, but also even when it does, it can sometimes secure individual liberties for only part of the group within the state. Case in point, African-Americans, um, their individual liberties were not secured, and some might still argue that they are not, given that they are not treated equally, um, but also allows um, voluntary interplay of conflicting interests. In the most recent election, you might notice that the question of um, whether, you know, so whether really litigating the 2020 election or issues such as climate change or um, guns or a woman's right to choose, these are contested at um, societal level and are expressed often through who rules and what kind of things that they can do. 
Ah. Now, Weber also looks at the personnel with the highest decision authority, which is um, the rulers. And so again, in two years time, in two, two years ago, there was a selection. This midterm election is a selection of rulers. Um, and so these are the personnel within people of government that utilizes different administrative uh, apparatus at different levels, city level, state level, Congress, uh, president, um, those kinds of things. And so, but also these structures function according to set rules, which sometimes can be amended, but with processes. All powers of command are in the political authority, and they are in different official jurisdictions, which are in theory most harmonious, and when they are not, then there's a determination to be made by courts and those other um, institutions. So if, if someone walked up to you on the street and wanted to know about uh, Max Weber's concept of a state, I doubt that will happen very much. These are the um, seven most critical elements of a state. Monopoly of the legitimate use of violence within a given territory. This is important because otherwise, if you don't have a monopoly of use of violence, then you have cartels, warlords, um, and that is not necessarily. Um, so we cannot, while well, we cannot dismiss the um, utility sometimes of alternate authority systems. I don't know that cartels and those kinds of gangs are the best arbiters of a good economic way of life, um, of being, um, and while they may provide schools and social services and so on, um, also remember that um, they, they are the apparatus of justice and so this, a lot of times the justice is not but so when one thinks that this is one of the most important characteristics and if you think about the failed states this one thing they don't have the centralization of the material and the ideal means of rule um so government and its apparatus distribution of command among powers so for example the u.s uh, constitution um, articulates three branches of government the legislative the executive and the uh, judiciary and they, it's, you know, a lot of times you hear checks and balances. Um, an administrative and legal order which claims binding authority, not over the, just the members of the states, but within areas of jurisdiction. So the, these administrative orders, this legal order, and the, um, the claims are binding. So if you think about the, uh, so think about, for example, the Supreme Court comprising of nine justices. Where does their power come from and how do they enforce the decisions? They don't do it themselves, but there's a Department of Justice that will actually do that kind of thing. And so we're talking about a legal order that goes not from one person, but it's, it's a group of people. Um, so the subject to change through legislation or what uh, Weber calls Zatsung. Um, and again, you will always see bills being made, whether they are or courts be determining issues, for example, um, Jackson, well, is it Dobbs? Um, this is Jackson um, Women's Health. And, and so these are, um, I think, demonstrations of um changes so you you do find different types of um, legislation that go through that are adopted or not um the government who have organized activities oriented to the enforcement and realization of these uh, administrative and legal order so think of the government and think of the um bureaucracy think about um, the civil service and so these are, and, and so every order, whether these sub-governments have these um, organized activities, enforcement, so think of state courts, think of city police or campus police or, so it's it's layers of, but at this point we're just talking about the 
um, the state. This regulation of the competition for political offices and selection of the bearers of rulership according to established rules. Now, this is important for um, the state. Now, the Weber's um, concepts or his, his uh, perspective is sufficiently broad to allow for even things like, say, um, um, to allow, for instance, if you look at North Korea, is there a regulation of the competition for political offices and selection of the bearers of rulership according to established rules? One would argue that yes, there is. Even though we do not think of them as democratic, um, it, it seems that there is, you know, if, if they didn't think that it was so great, maybe they were subjected to change or that so, uh, or legislation which he calls that so. Um, but whether he doesn't necessarily say there should be democratic elections. Um, regulation of the competition for political offices and selection of the bearers of rulership according to established rules. And maybe if you don't like the rules, maybe vote so you can change the rules even though that, yeah. So Weber um, talks about the use of Anstalt, the quasi-cooperative compulsory institution that the, is the state. So the um, political rule is not personal, it's, um, it's politics. Uh, with as difficult as that sounds right now, it's executing the office not according to your wishes, but according to the rules and guidance and so help you God. Um, so quasi-cooperative compulsory institution, you can come in and do the things that you wanted to do, even though you might think it's good policy. So think about the student loan um, situation that's going on. The current president thinks it's probably a great idea, but you know, uh, there's only so much he can do. Um, these established rules, um, the mode of validity, it's compulsory. You can choose to um, follow some of, you know, again, we probably break some of the laws, um, but there's also a uh, rational powers of command or a bureaucracy. Um, so, Anstalt, um, he combines this with betrayal, which is exercise of the powers of command. Um, and so it's continuous persistent fear of activity. This is the character of a state. Uh, it's routinized. Um, so if you're spinning, this is what happens. If you need a marriage certificate, this is what happens. Um, and so all of these are supported by the bureaucratic administrative apparatus. So he, Weber talks of the state as the trips and the state of political rule being a continuous activity of a plurality of men specified by set rules, exercising the power of command, uh, not on the basis of personal authority and according to their own whim, but on the basis of impersonal norms established by enactment. And I think this is a good definition for political rule continuous activity, plurality of men. Um, now, again, this, uh, the definition does not necessarily mean that this is what happens everywhere. North Korea is a great example. Um, so when forming the state, you know, whether we're talking about Leviathan, now we can talk about Leviathan in the abstract, but Weber looks at this in terms of what actually needs to happen. And so we think of the monopolization of the use of legitimate force um, in the concentration of this within a supreme ruler. So for example, it's not like a platoon leader who gives the permission to go to war. Uh, it's a supreme leader and you'll find that a lot of, in a lot of countries and jurisdictions, this will be probably the president. Now, the Fiegesel Schaftung um, of the exercise of political rule. Um, so the creation of body officials that, are, that takes these official activities regulated by a set of rules and serve as the transmitters of the will of the supreme 
um, ruler. So it's not just people doing what they think, it's actually people doing what um, the rules state. Again, executing the office to which um, you've been elected or um, appointed to. Now, so again, uh, moving on with the formation of state, the fusion of autonomous, autonomous power blocks into an all encompassing compulsory association. So this, a good example of this would be, for example, the American Indian nations now, or say um, the, a group of religious believers, say the Mormons. They, so you have these different power groups, these, these different sets of groups, uh, but they are all then subsumed under this all encompassing authority. Now, of course, they have the right to practice their own religion and other things, uh, but you will see that this, fus this fusion of these autonomous power blocks into a encompassing in compulsory association. Um, so this, this is based on territory, unitary legal order, uh, unitary public power or stats give out. So even if you live um, in those, say, American Indian nations, you, you're then still subsumed under, for example, the uh, United States. And then there's a system of relationships of direct obedience to and protection by the public uh, power. This becomes a challenge in the context of, um, you know, when, and, and this has been maybe highlighted more recently, who has jurisdiction of crimes that occur within American Indian nations? And so the short answer is actually the Federal Bureau of Investigation, but there's also the, so like state police in general, in theory have no such power. They can't go to the reservations and arrest people for crimes that are committed within the reservations, even though we don't know if this is necessarily true. Um, and so this is what we're talking about, the fusion of autonomous power blocks into an all encompassing compulsory association within a territory, legal order, public power, um, and so on. Now, so the transfer of the fullness of power from the person of the ruler to an impersonal institution. So the president, the presidency does certain things and, and you do see some of these transfers. So for example, think of the nuclear football. The nuclear football does not belong to any one president, it belongs to the presidency. Um, and whenever power is transferred or say Air Force One, and, and these are maybe more like uh, superficial items, but um, these are the emblems of transfer of power, um, the transfer of the command of the military, you know, those kinds of things. So this is um, emblematic of the um, of the, of the will of the people, the unity of the people, which Weber calls folk or the nation. Um, and sometimes it's expressed by the mediation of representative bodies. Um, consider the War Powers Act. So the institution of the presidency may say one thing, and but the legislative powers and bodies may some, say something different, um, but the the occupier of that office um, in personal institution is a trustee of the prerogatives of command and physical coercion. So for example, if you want Russia to get out of Ukraine, in theory, you know, the presidency makes those um, kinds of. So again, it's, it's more of um, what kinds of institutions are we are we talking about um, when we when we contemplate transfer of the fullness of powers from the person of the ruler to an impersonal institution? And so this is a more organized legal order. Um, 
And so when, when we think about this as the model of a state, then we can go back to European history and think about how it informs state uh, evolution. And the question of, is this the best form of coercive organized central, central authority? Um, and so, you know, again, there's this question of what about those many different groups of people that lived in other places and did not have this centralized, at least not to this extent, um, states. But um, we can see some necessity for the origins, and, and this would be something good to look into. So if you think about fiefdoms, uh, if you think of the uh, of the fiefdom, the lords, um, the peasants, and that relationship then evolves into sort of control over the affairs of a large part. And so again, this might become the governors um, or boroughs or other form of um, social organization. Um, so but we also see the, the role of church and state as a dualism um states estates and the prince um but also the the beginning of the inclusion of capitalism as another part of um of forming decentralized authority um now when we think about the the development of the feudal state we begin to see an institutionalization of the powers of command. So these are now sort of institutionalized in the Lord. Um, but we also see the emergence of power blocks, competition of the powerful. So for example, the bands of mercenaries and so on, who then maybe um, sell their, their military skills to groups of individuals or um, lords so that then this can coerce more um, resources to themselves. Um, so it, the development of the state actually is a very slow process, even though you have, for example, the Frankish kingdoms that were ruled by uh, people like Charlemagne, uh, but it's, it's a very gradual process that then begins with cities um, and then towards the state but even the development of the state will lead us to questions of allocation, appropriation, expropriation, and redistribution of power, power sharing between the church and the state, um, and those kinds of things. And the, the institutions that result from these interactions. Um, so at the same time, we see the industry of individual leaders who seek to unite Groups and um, now, of course, it has to have some meaning for them. Otherwise, why would you be part of this um, state enterprise? Um, and so, the a lot of times, and especially during the medieval period, you found that a lot of leaders were also church-oriented um, individuals. A great example is Pope Leo, I think, the eighth, who crowned Charlemagne emperor of um, the Byzantine Empire. And so this not only commands the resources of the spiritual world, but also the resources of the um, of the political world. And so the ruler it now has many prerogatives and resources, um, including, for example, sale of titles of nobility and um, those kinds of things to exercise lordships or protective powers, um, powers of a military leader, status as a feudal overlord, resources, um, um, so the royal domain. And again, if you think about the, the relationship of the formation of the state to modernity, to, um, with particular reference to the UK, England, and um, Italy, actually, the Catholic Church, owns quite a bit of land, and so does the, uh, the English monarch, because a lot of these things could be given um, to them. 
So, you know, again, think about how the ruler is able to collate all of these resources and use them to further their, their but also use them to uh, recruit others to support them. Um, so whether it's through the power of taxation, tolls, monopolies, or uh, trading concessions, these were some of the, um, yeah. Now, as we go into the maybe 16th, 17th centuries, when there's the great debate on what is a state and what is the relationship between state and people, uh, we begin to see the struggles, particularly in France, over, you know, the, the, the monarch and the estates. Now, we previously talked about the, the different, um, I think we call them the, uh, so today if you think about society, we think about classes. So the upper class, middle class, and the, mm, do they say lower class? And so um, then we had estates. So the, um, especially the, the, the perfect example is in France, but this was reproduced everywhere, uh, most everywhere in Europe. So we had um, the three estates. The first estate was um, the aristocracy, so kings, queens, and nobles, and lords, and so on. Then there was the second estate, which was the clergy. The third estate was the commoners. Uh, and so there's a struggle between these uh, particularly because, for example, the king, you know, according to the royal prerogative, could do whatever they wanted because they were appointed by God, even though, uh, for example, the third estate did not agree. And if you look at the numbers, um, the, the first estate in France was about maybe 40,000. The second estate was about 200,000 and the third estate was about 25 million. And so it's sort of the oppression of the uh, of the third estate by the first and second estates, um, but also shows the power dynamics. So you see these struggles that are trying to get at what is the right balance of a state. Um, so you do see um, the increasing implementation of bureaucracy, le bureau, um, organization of things within the state, standing armies. So instead of using mercenaries and, uh, and knights, it's sort of like, okay, let's have standing armies that are loyal to the king and to the notion of what that polity represents. Um, so patriotism, and you might know that this from uh, thinking about military recruitment, one of the things that you have to do is to take an oath. But also, if you are from a different, uh, if you're not American and join the, mili the American military, you have to take an oath. Um, actually, first you become a citizen and then you take an oath, um, you know, to serve and protect the country. So you are committing to, you're not committing to, you know, I, I will serve and protect Donald Trump or Joe Biden. It's it's that idea of the state. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> um, and so the standing army is created. And so to pay for the standing army and make sure that it doesn't take over uh, from and, and maybe kill the leader, you have to pay them. How do you pay them? You pay them using taxes. And so you see an increase in taxes. Um, and so the, the ruler, king, prince, uh, the, the royal, is now the embodiment of the whole realm with powers of the realm or the country or <clears throat> the territory concentrated in his hands. Um, and then there wouldn't be tolerance of powers that were not derived from their sovereign will because he's the embodiment of that country. In fact, I think it was the um, uh, Louis the Sixteenth who famously said, uh, "L'état c'est moi." The the state is me. I am the state. Um, and so we we also begin to see these ideas of sovereignty come into into um, play. What is sovereignty? The idea that um, a country can determine what goes on within its territory. 
But also there are those who look at sovereignty as uh, an embodiment of rule in the one. So the one individual who is in charge of um, the state. So this is where we see the concentration of state and, um, and the ruler. Um, so, you know, again, it's useful to think about what we think about these developments now. Um, and we do this by looking at um, uh, Max Weber, where he suggests that in his person, the king as a supreme earthly authority absorbs the um, whole body politic. Um, and so he writes, the king represents the nation as a whole, and no individual represents another individual against the king. Consequently, all power, all authority resides in the king. The nation is not embodied in France. It resides in, entire, in its entirety in the person of the king. Now, this is um, probably a, a troubling view of the state being the king and the king being the state. Because if you look at how it was used to uh, in places like Germany, um, so think about how Germans um, eventually changed their greeting to hailing a leader rather than Germany. They didn't say Heil Deutschland. Um, and so this, this embodiment of the state in the person becomes rather dangerous because it's, you know, you are, and, and, and again, when you think about the formation of states and um, how states operate, including, um, for example, the embodiment of the state in an individual or in a party, for example, the Communist Party is, is the arbiter of things within communist nations, but also now here you see an individual becomes the, the state and even the allegiance is to the person, not to the state or the idea. Um, um, and so if you again go to, you do see the contrasts in the Hitler regime versus, uh, for example, the American Oath of Allegiance. You do not um, plead allegiance to a person. Now, I actually have some experience with this. No, well, not in the US, but um, many years ago, um, Kenya's second president, Daniel Arab, Arab Moy, um, had this is the best form of maybe um, indoctrination, um, but kids in school, of course, would sing the national anthem and they'd say the loyalty pledge. And I think if I remember well, it went something like this, I pledge my loyalty and uh, something to the president and the nation of Kenya. Um, so you, uh, the president, there was one president, he ruled for 24 years. I pledge my allegiance, uh, my, I pledge my loyalty to the um, President and the Republic of Kenya. So it, it's a clever way of, okay, you're pledging allegiance to the Republic of Kenya, but also to the President, and there's only one re President. I don't know if it would have made a difference if, um, you know, they had been, if I was pledging allegiance to the previous President. Um, but but this is this these are some of the dangers of l'état c'est moi the state is the person um, and so we see it very dangerously in um, in especially Germany and I think some people might see like this was beginning to happen a few uh, maybe a presidency ago so. Um, yeah, so the, the state becomes man, but I, we don't even think that necessarily even people like Hobbes were thinking about the state as being maybe embodied in one person. It's, it's embodied in certain order, absence of certain challenges. But we can conclude from Hobbes a famous passage that state is order. State is order, not necessarily an individual, but 
a way of um, organizing to facilitate commerce and other things. Now, state can be also time bound. And if you look at this utopian futuristic movies, you know, what is a state? Um, you may be familiar with this, this um, today, if you wanted to join the state known as um, Asgard, Yes, Asgard from the Thor movies. You can become a member of Asgard. Now, does Asgard exist? It's a virtual state. Uh, but this maybe um, suggests to us that um, these different ways of looking at the state. So is, a, is the state a time and condition bound concept? Um, or does it refer to a person's legal position? Is it a legally, legally, legally organized body of men, form of government? Uh, is it rule? Is it, um, you know, what is it? Is it a body politic? Um, so we, we sort of think about the evolution of the term state um, and, and perhaps um, a good definition is the apparatus. Uh, and its proper use to maintain or acquire political rule, which I think is a helpful way of um, thinking about it. Um, and so when we sort of think about um, the state, uh, we see this as being some of the characteristics of the state. So um, sovereignty of ruler, territorial validity of rule, but this again may be more linked to uh, Machiavelli and the Prince. Um, but we especially think of supreme political authority, precise defined territory, sovereignty of the ruler, territorial validity, existence of a permanent military, as opposed to mercenaries um, or uh, contract uh, for higher soldiers, presence of administrative bodies, separation of private sp uh, sphere from the public sphere. And this is what, um, again, Hobbes was writing. Uh, the 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 office the person who is elected into the office executes the office not their own preferences uh, opposition of political power civil society having neither princely uh, nor unitary public rules separated from both um, so we see Mach the Machiavellian conception of the state now of course there are critiques for example. Uh, people like uh, Weber, um, you know, some conditions might be rudimentary um, and some individual rights may not be assured, but then every other thing is found. It, does that mean that that is not a state? Uh, but there's also those who think that the state may be found in early political um, characteristics, so early political formations. And, you know, to this end, one, if you think about um, for example, the Aztec and the Inca empires, you want to think that they had a lot of this. And so why are they states? And why do we then refer them as tribal rule versus states? Um, and so, you know, the, the question of continuous development, is a state continuing to develop or has it completed its development? And the, perception is that it's still continuing the development. But there's also questions of the danger of Weber state definitions. So it's almost like he is looking at the characteristics of the current state that did not necessarily exist then. Now, that is maybe subjective because if, if, you, if you go back to, for example, the Roman Empire, during the birth of Jesus, um, there was a census that was being taken and so isn't a sense as one of, for example, those governmental authority things that they do? And so wouldn't that require a well-organized group of people, i.e. bureaucracy? Um, and so also the, there's the danger of uh, the generality of what a state is so that, you know, those that deviate from this definition, what do we call them? What do we call 
uh, chieftains and tribal groupings that had some, not all of these elements. Um, and so there are those who think that maybe the uh, definition of the state is incomplete. And the question is, how do you then, you know, how do you account for those things that are missing from these definitions? Um, so there are those who see theories of the state as a unique historical phenomenon, and we don't know if this is a, actually, if you think about states that we've been around for like, what, three, four, maybe 400 years, um, a man's existence has been longer than that. But um, to um, think about the, the state today in combining both Weber, Krasner, and other um, historical approaches, the state, according to modern definitions, has territory, population, economy, social infra infrastructure systems, so like education, jails, police, and so on, government with monopoly of violence, um, exercises sovereignty, and so it can decide what to do within its, um, within its territory, um, and enjoys international and external recognition. So you can't just like go plant a flag at your house and issue currency. Although there was a guy in Australia who did that um, and declared a kingdom. Uh, I think he, he was right on the money. I mean, you could declare your um, sovereignty maybe. I don't know. Well, legally it's not allowed, but uh, people still do some of those things. Um, so states sometimes are seen as products of ethnic nationalism. Um, so perception of common origins, historical experiences, language, culture and destiny, and these can be sometimes very binding. A very useful way to think about this is the current uh, World Cup soccer. So this is a competition amongst different teams. And even though some of us will cheer for teams that um, are from countries we may not have gone to. So for example, um, not sure who I was listening to saying that their team is Brazil, even though they are American and when the US plays, then they will support the US, but otherwise they support Brazil. So, you know, this sense of um, um, I think feeling connected to or affinity to different groups, people, um, language, culture, um, and some shared experiences. So if you ask most Americans about 9-11, uh, that was a national encapsulating event. Um, but so, yeah, the, the states can be a product of ethnic nationalism, which can be very destructive as we saw in Germany. Um, but also in the early 20th century United States with eugenics and the exclusion of, for example, Italians and the Irish. So the, the, the ethnic state has not been a very good um, chapter of our existence. Um, so states do claim and usually maintains legitimate use of violence, but there's still violence that occurs even within states. And so do states have it bottled up? We don't necessarily think that it does. Um, the state in theory offers protection to all, but again, if crime happens, is a state doing enough to um, to offer protection. Now, if you if you think about, for example, the U.S. and the notion of, say, the castle rules, is that they call castle? Um, yeah, stand your ground rules, or the right to keep and bear arms. It's almost a recognition that there will not always be government to protect you, but also this is kind of a double-edged sword because you can still use that to harm people. Um, and so 
you know, the, this is a very broad discussion about this and, and whether this is legitimate. But also if you think about some of the uh, societal events that occur because people actually have access to weapons, then there's a question of, are we, is it better or not to have weapons? Particularly if the police are not that far away. Um, and so, you know, these are content, contendi, contending uh, perspectives. Does the government have um, business monopolizing means of force or violence, or should we leave it? But then, then the question would be, why does government exist? And again, if you go to the Declaration of Independence, um, I think this is a, this is a statement there about um, to ensure our general welfare. So what then is general welfare? Um, so these are very contentious issues. But again, if you then go into the math of um, criminal activities in the US versus other places, you you know, it's does keeping in bearing arms reduce illegitimate violence or does it even make it more possible? Um, I have no opinion on that, but from an academic perspective, I think it does not um, help in, so when, when citizens can use violence, it becomes more difficult for the government um, to determine what is going on. Um, now, so there's also the question of whether the state protects or people in those that it excludes. So for example, you know, the US as a state did not protect the rights of minorities, especially African Americans. Countries like um, China does not um, protect the minority that is Uyghurs, spelled U-Y-G-H-U-R. Um, or uh, Europe actually, today, most countries of Europe don't protect the Roma people, um, otherwise Roma. Um, some earlier references used to refer to gypsies. Um, so is the government, uh, and in fact, when you, you will find a lot of um, <sighs> genocides and ethnic cleansing that target certain people, certain groups, not because they have necessarily done something. Um, and so, you know, does, can government legitimately claim legitimate um, use of violence or um, to have corralled those means? But again, not all states have the same capacity, even though they are still states. So I like to think of Palau and its uh, capacities and what China could make it do. Um, yeah, so when we further think about the state, uh, we think about, and we are thinking broadly about justification of the states, what are citizens' obligations? And so you will find some maybe um, broad obligations when you're a citizen of a place. So for example, um, you know, obeying the law of the land, but, but this does not only require you to do so if you're a citizen of that country. Um, because of the idea of reciprocity, if I am here, but I am from Kenya, I will not just obey the Kenyan law here or say I'm only bound by the Kenyan law, I will obey the law of the land I am in, pay taxes, fight in defense of the state. Now, no, this is probably not for visitors. Behave patriotically, even though this is not a requirement, but you will find people doing that, especially during World Cup and other tournaments and those kinds of things, wars. Um, expose enemies of the state. And you may have heard of this a lot. Uh, if you see something, say something. Now, I think this is not necessarily an obligation to the state. I think this qualifies as, as an obligation to yourself. And uh, we have previously discussed, maybe we have questions of 
you know, have you ever been uh, randomly selected for additional screening? And if you have, you know, is that for your own good or for the good of all? And I think this is something that can be looked at as for the good of all. Um, but if you maybe know someone is plotting against the country, it's a, a general normal circumstance, circumstantial duty to report these kinds of things. Um, so the political obligations that uh, citizens have will be to obey each law. But again, you know, some people do break the law, like they don't, they speed and do other things. Um, not because, and, and again, we don't always obey political laws or laws that have been passed because they are political or because it's an obligation, because some of them are actually moral law. So, and we have talked about this, do people not kill because killing is immoral or illegal, or do people not kill because it's immoral? Um, if there wasn't a law against killing people, well, I guess some people would still kill some people, which is a terrible conversation to have. Um, but th this, this great discussion over whether we obey laws because they are moral, or because they are laws, but then, you know, again, if you are, for example, driving someone to hospital and, you know, and you, you are speeding, there are, do you obey the law and, and drive at normal traffic pace? Um, so for example, if someone is about to have a baby, do you drive, you know, normal speed or do you, speed because it's a medical emergency. So, you know, again, these are questions that are valid, important, uh, but also I think we can conclude that we, the political obligation to, be, to obey each law sometimes runs into the moral obligation. And so it's not just the political obligation. Um, so, you know, again, traffic laws, um, things like paying taxes and uh, pro-life um, stances. So um, we can make some decisions on those kinds of things. Um, now, th there is sometimes it's exceptions based on, on your belief and faith and convictions. So one of the, I think, most useful examples of this is conscientious objectors. So um, this was especially seen during the Vietnam War. People who did not believe the U.S. should have been fighting um, could claim being conscientious objectors. However, there is sometimes um, the unexpected um, pushback of being seen as a coward. Um, now, there are people who are eternal pacifists and sometimes I think I am one of them. Um, fighting doesn't solve anything except to stop evil like Hitler. And so, you know, those are military, military obligations, but still, can we find ways to account for citizen preferences, well, at least most preferences, um, in, in not obey. Now, this is also the other question of, if you're protesting against um, injustice, inhumanity, and break the law, is that justified? And so, in, you know, the, so the, notion of living in a democracy requires us to consider political participation. Now, political participation is not just voting, it can also be protest. And I'm sure there's like protests and sign size and those kinds of things. Um, but protests can be expressed as, um, you know, as voting or sometimes you just need to. So if you think about the, uh, for example, George Floyd uh, social justice marches in 2020, 
Um, and often this will change the course of history. So think about Martin Luther King Jr. Um, or the sit-in movement. And so political obligations may require us to do certain things, but morality may require us to do other things. And so uh, political obligations do not always win. Um, so then we run into this question of can we obey all laws at all times? Now, I don't think there are many people who wake up and say, let me see how many laws I can break today. But people still do break laws. Um, and in principle, we should follow all laws. But what if the laws are um, maybe unjust? So if, if we contemplate um, a hypothetical where, for example, um, you lived in Germany in 1933 and, you, and there was a new law that you had to turn in any Jewish people you saw and you knew they were going to then go to concentration camps, do we not have a moral obligation to not um, hand to to not follow the law? So you know, again, there are these there are these questions about political obligations as a member of the state and how far we go to fulfill those political um, obligations. So we. We should follow all laws, but, but there are moral judgments, moral duties, whether or not we agree to them and whether or not we can follow them. And so it doesn't have to be the Jewish people. It can also be, let's go fight Vietnam or you know some other place. And so, um, you know, this now, usually not many states will make you make those kinds of choices but if you if you have followed the um, Russian invasion of Ukraine at any length this is probably one of the best examples of um, when there is a war if you're Russian and you're thinking I don't understand why there's a war and then there's a there's a military draft instituted what is your political obligation, what is your moral obligation, and do those two things agree? Um, and then ultimately, what should you do about that? Um, so, you know, political obligations can run into the challenge of moral uh, duties and, and moral um, decision making. Now, so when we consent to the state, in theory, we have the, the political obligation to follow all the laws. But, you know, again, we're going to run into uh, these just laws, uh, nuisance laws in the US in the 1870s, 1880s, um, Jim Crow laws. Do we, is there a moral obligation to follow them just because they are laws? Um, and so again, we must contend with those kinds of things. Um, now, there is, um, it's, it's useful to return to, th this is my private opinion, but if you, if you really want to read something important um, that will stay with you, I think every voter should be made to read Rosu's um, social contract. Um, but you actually begin to see this these, um, cross pollination of ideas from Rozu and um, and Locke. So Locke, for example, suggests or writes, "I affirm, I more moreover affirm that all men are naturally in the state of nature and remain so till by their own consents they make themselves members of the of some politic political society." Um, so until by their own consent make themselves members of some politic society. Now, Rosu also, if you remember in the beginning, it talks about um, the obligation of children to parents only 
or to the father, only to the extent that he can protect them. But other than that, they must make the laws themselves that they live under. Um, so, you know, everything begins to in its aspect, men who have up to now been roving in the woods by taking to a more settled manner of life, come gradually together, form separate bodies, and at length in every country arises a distinct nation. Now, he actually talks a lot about, um, in great detail, about uh, making the laws that they must live under and deliberating those laws. But I think we can conclude that all the laws that you live under, you haven't had a hand in making them or repealing them. Um, and so the question then becomes, is this what society or if, if someone is imposing a political obligation on you, isn't it in your interest to have some say in it? Um, so the social contract theory um, is this idea that every individual has consented to the state and therefore is in contract with a state. Um, no, now, not only have you made a contract with the state, but you have made contracts with other individuals who are in the state. Um, and so everyone has consented both to each other and to the state. So everyone is obligated and uh, obligations come into effect through consent. Now, there are those who will say that, for example, living in the United States, consents to certain things. So for example, a decent standard of life, but if the US goes to war, then that is part of the political obligation of you being living here, being an American. Um, some people differ, um, but this is sort of the, uh, um, I think to reiterate the social contract theory, every individual has con consented to the state, um, is in contract with the state, individuals have made each other uh, contracts with each other to create some sort of order. Um, but as I mentioned before, um, we, and you hear a lot of um, references to the consent to be governed or the consent of the governed, including by law. Um, now, the Pledge of Allegiance, but is allegiance consent to be governed? What if you are pledging allegiance today and then those in power tomorrow do something that you're like, oh no, I'm withdrawing my pledge of allegiance. I can't have allegiance to this kind of government anymore. Um, but also think about Boy Scouts and, and uh, children, even when they do the pledge of allegiance, technically, because they are under 18, they have no legal standing. They cannot give consent. They don't have consent to give and yeah. Um, in some countries, the age of consent is different, and this is all, you know, but also, you know, if you're an emancipated minor. But, um, you know, so the, the, the people who are required to pledge membership of this collective have no standing to actually do so, and therefore that is not even enforceable. Um, Citizens who become American citizens through naturalization do pledge to be governed, but how many are those? And so what happens to the other citizens? How do you pledge your consent to be governed? And this actually has been raised very uh, frequently that if I just found myself living in the US because I was born here, does that mean I, I consent to be governed? Um, but com consent can be governed through the ballot box, even though occasionally uh, some governments will take um, the right to vote away, whether from uh, convicted um, people convicted of a felonious um, offense, or in the pre-1965 America because of the color of your skin. Um, so then can we suggest that this is consent to be governed by including through laws that you didn't make and don't agree with. Um, but also, um, now of course there, there has been questions about those people who don't vote. So if you think about uh, midterm election turnouts, they are usually about 60% of eligible voters, not even the children. What about the other 40%? Um, now, there are those who argue that not voting is 
actually making some sort of statement. And so um, you don't have to vote, you can not vote. And so not voting itself is making a statement. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, but there are also people who vote against the system. And so if you if you look at the analysis of, for example, the just past um, midterm elections, there are people who are voting against an idea, not necessarily voting for a person, but voting against an idea or a policy or um, a group of things that they do not agree with. Um, so this opportunity to demonstrate what um, one way or the other, how one feels. Now, so this is what we might call tacit consent. Um, one of the, um, and, and this is how you sort of arrive at this. So you have maybe heard of um, voting fraud, voter fraud, even, even though, you know, we are not taking a position here over whether there was or there wasn't. Um, the legality of voting is, especially in certain elections, is determined by citizenship. So generally, if you're not a US citizen, you can't vote in like midterm elections or presidential elections. Now, in a very strange um, twist of normal behavior, if you live in Tacoma Park um, and you're voting for the council elections, it doesn't matter if you're an American citizen or not, you can vote uh, if you live within that community. So that, again, is a community of physical presence. Um, now, so voting is in federal elections, as they call them is governed by American citizenship. If you're not a citizen, you cannot vote. So there is this theory that if you vote, you're providing tacit consent because that is one of the benefits of being a citizen. Um, and so most theorists will rely on this tacit implied consent, but still we have to think about those people who do not vote. Um, do they, can we consider that to be tacit consent to not vote or to not express an opinion? Um, so, but also other things, for example, the tacit enjoyment of a state's benefits. Um, so if, if you think of um, the COVID-19 pandemic, there was um, a series of payments that were made to the by the government to most um, taxpayers. And so I, I don't know if anyone returned those payments. If someone did, that might maybe um, express or um, demonstrate consent. Now, so this tacit consent, which is very challenging to, to prove because then that you could have received those benefits, but you could still be a tax paying non-American citizen, which means you can vote or run for office. So it, it gets complex, um, but Locke suggests um, that express consent makes you a full member. Um, so, you know, every month that has possession or enjoyment or any part of the dominions of any government that thereby give his tacit consent and is um, far forth obliged to obedience to the laws of government during such enjoyment as anyone under it. Uh, but then, of course, you have these questions of, you know, like voting and, and citizenship and so on. And I, I'm not necessarily certain that Locke addresses this question. Um, it's almost like you live there, so you, you know you you're obligated to that government. But what if you live in a different country and you cannot vote? Um, what does that say about consent? Um, so you know, then again, these questions of implied consent um, and whether that is you know 
is actual consent with a residency is implied consent or it's actually consent so this comes uh from david hume um who who writes can we seriously say that a poor peasant or artisan has a free choice to leave his country when he knows no foreign language or manners and lives from day to day by the small wages he acquires we may as well assert that a man by remaining a vessel freely consents to the dominion of the master though he was carried on board while asleep and must leap into the ocean and perish the moment he leaves her so it's almost like the the argument of you you are born here so that means consent and the question of whether not giving consent means you should leave um but the the problem is that you will find that around the world nobody has a right to be stateless so even if you left you would go to another dominion um another country even if you had foreign manners and language and you know those kinds of things even a uh, skill you cannot volunteer voluntarily be stateless and so it's almost implied globally that where you're born is where you have citizenship and you cannot abandon that and be stateless um, but there is i think uh, another point that hume makes that we ought to point to so residence alone cannot be construed as consent uh, because you you know even if it was so for example let's say I wanted to join US military in fighting in Iraq, there are other conditions that keep me out of that. Um, now, if I was in Kenya and you know there was a war with Somalia and, and I objected to the war, um, so my, my obedience to the political prerogatives it challenges that country, it doesn't mean that you know i can i can stay and still maybe be expressing discontent but anyway i think especially with maybe 17th 18th century uh individuals he makes a very good point residence alone cannot be constructed construed as consent because it's not like you had a choice to be there or not you were born there and your life station made clear, made possible what you do. Uh, but also, leaving the country cannot be the only method of withdrawing consent. And, and here we see, for example, conscientious objectors. You can withdraw consent to be governed, um, at least in some elements. But also, I think we ought to remember uh, in Harry Doom's definition of government which is the one that can coerce you to do the things that it would also punish you for doing um, and so he makes very good points residence is not consent and leaving the country is not the only method of withdrawing consent and states would do well to think about maybe this and other um, so <sighs> hypotheticals are amazing um, we previously talked about the state of nature and how, for example, Rousseau did not believe that the state of nature existed, that it could not have existed in any time in which we can fathom. So, um, so we can look at the state of nature as hypothetical, just as we can look at um, the consent giving consent as hypothetical. Uh, now, of course, there's consent in certain things that, um, you know, are more personal. So think about personal relationships and think about what consent actually means. Now, I think we would agree that um, not objecting is not necessary giving consent you could be passed out um so i think this 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 is and, and this is a 
point about reflecting on the present based on the ideas that got us here from you know scholars and philosophers like Hume and Rousseau and Locke and others. Um, and so if we are thinking about hypotheticals, the conjectures about the state of nature, it's hypothetical. It has not existed in any time we can apprehend. Um, there is state failure, but even then there are, there are forms of organization. We may not call them state, but you know. Um, and so one of the ideas is that if mankind were in the state of nature, they would contract to bring about the state, which in theory would, even if it had happened, then would have caused the states to be formed. Now, if we were so if we were in a state of nature, we would attempt to construct a state. Um, but again, we are talking about the, the perceived absence of something. Now, so there, there are questions of whether we justify the state. Um, now, the state is by no means perfect. Um, it can be justified through its contributions to human being and our well-being. Should it just be justified by bringing us happiness? I'm not sure that any state can bring that because um, how, unless you separate the happiness that the state brings to other miseries of everyday life, um, then how would you know that the state is bringing you happiness? But also if, if it's bringing you happiness and say um, someone that you care about um, doesn't get sufficient medical care and passes away, does that mean the state is not bringing you happiness? Good questions to contemplate. Um, so according to Wolf, the way he looks at this, he talks about, um, he says that hypothetically, we give consent to the state, even if we were never asked. Uh, we give consent even without realizing it. Similarly, we can have thoughts, even if we do not realize we do. For example, knowing or believing giraffes do not have nine legs without forming the thought. So we don't need to, to actually articulate that giraffes don't have nine legs to believe it. We, it's, it's kind of a challenge to think about. But the point that he makes is that we give consent to the state without realizing it. But my, my, my further question is, you know, okay, you don't think giraffes have nine legs. You, you, you never do. But if someone asks you how many legs does a millipede have, millipede, you know, it's possible it's well, maybe it's not a million, but it's it's a bunch. So exactly how many? It's probably 50 or 70 or... So th there's a possibility there. Now, I think the same thought can be formed about state until you begin to object to some of the things that it is doing. And here's a good example. So when the state asked, or when, when the state commanded young Russians to report to recruitment stations, they made a statement of objection despite being, um, you know, being politically obligated to withdraw their consent to belonging to the Russian state to the extent that this war is ongoing. Um, and so I think this, this, uh, there's another thought here to be had, and as difficult as it is, how do you prove a negative? How do we prove that while well, consent may be implied, consent may also be expressly withdrawn when someone either renounces their citizenship and acquires other citizenship, or even without renouncing citizenship, seeks for political asylum in objection to political obligations imposed by the state that theoretically they give consent to. Okay, that's, um, mm, that's quite a bit. Anyway, so hypothetically we give consent to the state even if we were never asked. 
we give consent without realizing it. The caveat is that we can withdraw consent expressly by expressing our desire to seek asylum um, as a mark of withdrawing consent. Um, and, and sometimes it seems to me that until we are pushed to do one thing or another, then we would not necessarily. Um, so there are perspectives that um, the state of nature would make us appreciate the state, even though we don't know that we would know about the state if we lived in the state of nature. Philosophy can be very um, head turning. Um, how do you know about something if you don't have it? Uh, but they perhaps state failure, which again, we are not saying is the state of nature. It's maybe just a breakdown in one of the uh, Weberian um, constructs of the state, monopoly over violence, makes us appreciate the presence of state, even though then you, if you have states like North Korea in Venezuela and Libya, it, is there a, a an argument to be made that maybe not having state is a good thing. Uh, but it seems that the philosophers are telling us that we have consented to the state all along until we have withdrawn the consent, either by belonging to another state or by becoming refugees. And so we previously talked about the stateless people, 10 to 64 million. I think the number of refugees is much higher than that. And so, you know, when we sort of think about verbal expression of consent and its legality, age of consent, um, so, so there are those kinds of questions. And, and, you know, do we need the consent to be governed by a state to be verbally expressed? Now, it seems that we have moved towards um, that direction in a lot of our relationships. So marriage perhaps, or uh, joining the military or those kinds of things. Um, but again, and here's, here's how we know that um, ideas can be contentious. So if someone who is under 18 consents to marriage, even if um, they consent, is it legal? Now, perhaps not in the US, but what if it's a country where the, the legal age is 16? Um, and so does consent depend on where you are or maybe the expression of the legality of that thing? Um, did Native Americans consent to be governed by the United States? Um, or did we imply that they consented? Did colonialism, um, all those colonial subjects, did they consent to be governed? And so we are going to see that the state actually violates people a lot um, without asking them if they consent and they should. Um, something. Um, so th the question then, you, you know, we get to, and we have seen a bit of this sometimes in the people who uh, live outside of society, they don't, you know, they live in the, out in the country, in the woods. So people who may not consent to the state, how they express their lack of consent and some people might withdraw, have no contact with her. But again, even if they live off the, off the land, um, that land is in some ways governed by the state and sometimes you'll find that they follow those rules. So is that a form of consent or you know, um, rejection of the state. Um, so again, we come back to anarchists who say maybe government is a problem. It, it gets to be um, yeah, cyclical after a while. So, but the arguments advanced sometimes by anarchists are nobody asks, nobody asks me if we do not have a state. 
um, and the police do not request my permission to act as they do, and therefore they might act illegitimately. And I think we know that this is actually true. Um, so anarchists then say that the only reason to fear the state is not the contract or the moral obligation, it's fear of punishment. Uh, strong anarchists will say, well, you know, just ignore um, the state. Uh, but they also suggest that what the law requires is often independently required by, by morality. So, for example, um, not killing other people or maybe not taking their stuff if we have no contribution to their um, getting it. Um, so the idea that, um, you know, we, we fear the police and that's the only reason why, even though sometimes there's the moral obligation, but police and courts bring justice to infractions and do our dirty work for us because we, yeah. Um, now, philosophical anarchists say we should adopt um, a highly critical stance towards the state and police activities. When they act immorally, we should disobey, obstruct, and ignore. And so going back to Germany in the 1930s, it would seem that this would be a philosophical anarchist um, point. Um, highly critical stance towards the state and police activities because, again, Tragically, a lot of the laws that were passed in Germany against minorities and Jews and other undesirables as defined then, or even um, Jim Crow laws, these were not, these were passed through deliberative processes of the state, but they were inherently immoral, wrong, and so, you know, would then the philosophical anarchists been, would they have been right in suggesting that we ignore those? Um, and so the, 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 you know, this sort of brings us to those questions of, should we, we should sometimes question authority, Nazi Germany, German soldiers on the Eastern Front. So on the Eastern Front in Russia, they were, they were under orders to um, kill most the Russian soldiers and basically burn, rape, and but also this is like inferior people. So why are you messing with inferior people? Um, so the internment of the Japanese, should we have questioned that? We, I think so. Should we question extrajudicial killings? Now, I want to highlight um, an instance in which um, North Korea, so they just wanted to discuss and the human rights situation in North Korea. And North Korea brought to the UN Human Rights Council um, a report that was compiled by CNN um, highlighting the extrajudicial killings of black men. And North Korea wanted to discuss this. Um, so again, you know, just because there, there is consenting some or some semblance of uh, proper government and governance, doesn't mean that maybe we cannot question um, authority. And so this sort of brings us to the question of moral limits to obedience of the law. Um, and should we then suggest that we should disobey uh, if obedience would support oppression of others in our violation of their human rights, which in theory should be morally objectionable to us? And so it, it seems to us that maybe that is what we should um, aspire to do. Question authority, um, question Jim Crow, question um, segregation, question the uh, apartheid regime, question some of these other, um, especially when they happen within the countries to whom we have given consent to be governed um, and, you know, not just so we can move to the mountains and say, I'm withdrawing my consent, but perhaps to actually actively. Um, so the, the, again, going slightly back to anarchism, we think about um, some of the, um, some of the instances in which uh, there has been clear violation of human rights, uh, clear, issues that contradict morality 
as a function of the state. Um, so, you know, questions, for example, of moral judgment, um, questions, taxation of income purely for purposes of redistribution, um, the just or unjust nature of uh, wealth. And so, you know, this raise questions of whether we should only obey those laws that agree with that agree with our moral outlook. Now, if we did this, um, I hesitate to think about how um, some people might think that people who are less wealthy are less wealthy because of because they are lazy. But again, if you think about and, and here I'm going to step out of the lane for a minute and, and, and highlight, even though I'm not an anarchist, I think um, something like criminal records and you know background checks can be some of the biggest hindrances towards um, people actually, for example, getting jobs. And so even if I reformed and I have become a good person, but I did something in the past, then it would seem that that would not allow me to get a job. And, you know. But anyway, maybe we should stay away from that. Um, but, you know, again, think about how we make laws and how some of the laws that have been made by human beings are unequal. And so if you think of Hunger Games, you know, even though there was great objection to the to the Hunger Games, um, they, the, the participants still participated because these were the laws. Um, and so morally, we know they were wrong. But, you know, you, you kind of had to participate or the village might come into some grief. Um, and so, you know, again, the, 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 the challenge with anarchism is that we don't all have the same moral standards. And so um, this may be a challenge because unless we can come to maybe shared understandings of um, issues rather than individual interpretations. Um, I'm sure there's someone on this planet who thinks we should take every rich person's wealth and redistribute it um, with that person is me. Um, but, you know, there's probably someone else who thinks we should murder all the panda um, pandas in the world. And so the, the dangers of anarchism is what is the standard or is it somebody's perception? Um, now, we um, turn briefly into utilitarianism. So how do we find utility in concepts? Um, subjects should obey kings as long as the probable misuse of obedience are less than probable misuse of resistance. So this sounds like a personal preservation. And I think um, if, if you apply this to American concepts, even though we don't have kings, um, think about being stopped by um, police and clearly this is a charged issue. I shouldn't even be wading into it. Um, so, for example, if you speed, you stand a chance of getting pulled over and actually getting more late than you already were. But if you can get away with it, that's sort of like you're on time and you didn't get caught. Now, if you, so subjects should obey kings so long as the probable misuse of obedience are less than the probable misuse of resistance. Um, there is, um, if if you have siblings or have heard about the talk, like when someone gets pulled over by police and yeah, driving while black, um, this a whole um, this a whole point of maybe be or suggested behavior, you know, hands out of the car. Um, driver's license and maybe insurance in hand because, you know, they're going to ask for them. Don't, you know, don't answer back. You're probably going to get home, which, you know. Now, 
from personal experience with such a situation, um, 2000 and maybe seven or eight in somewhere in Maryland, um, you know, I had the moment to think I am not going to die on a bridge, you know, like 16,000 miles from home. And so however, however else I would have been feeling or whatever I was going to be asked to do, I was going to do it because, you know, the probable mischiefs of obedience were less than the probable mischiefs of resistance, including, you know, um, now that doesn't mean that people haven't just been doing regular stuff and gotten, um, but utilitarianism tells us that, you know, do those things that you need to do to survive because, you know, um, yeah. So randomly watching crime shows, I usually see sometimes people get busted by police and run. And I'm thinking this is a whole infrastructure dedicated to, you know, catching you, so you were going to, uh, but so utilitarianism, we should obey kings as long as the probable mischiefs of obedience are less than the probable mischiefs of resistance. Um, but if you can get away with not obeying and the outcome is better, according to Bentham, that is what you should do. Um, now, the Bentham also suggests that the moral, morally correct action in any situation is that which brings about the highest total sum of utility. I don't know that this is, you know, again, sometimes rose colored glasses, Emmett Till, you know, yeah, so maybe the, the morally correct action, it, it, this assumes a perfectly fair equal society um, without, yeah, but, but that doesn't. Um, so you, utilitarianism requires you to perform the action that will create more happiness or less unhappiness in the world than any other action available at the time. Now, the problem is the whole world doesn't know this. If, if it did, then this would be great advice. Um, so but utilitarianism can also be the tragedy of the commons. The, the tragedy of the commons is used to refer to you know, like 10 farmers who have sheep and they all bring them to the common place where they graze and they graze for a few days and then all the grass is gone. Now, individual utility, it's good for my sheep and goats to be grazing and it's it's um, perfectly wonderful for all the other people who are grazing there. But after a few days, we don't have any grass to graze our sheep and goats. So um, this is a tragedy of the commons that we pursue individual utility at the expense of, um, so think about the tragedy of the commons. For example, the, the, the issue of climate change. Um, Everybody agrees that we should stop polluting, but nobody is agreeing how we should do that or who should stop or how we should stop this. It's almost like, oh, but the, you know, your heating bills are so high and, you know. So this is a tragedy of the commons. Um, now, if, you if utilitarianism requires me to do those things that make me happy and taking other people's stuff makes me happy, um, and me being happy as part of general societal happiness, then I should steal other people's stuff. Um, and I guess there would be other people doing that and maybe other people murdering other people. And so, you know, pursuit of our own utilitarian happiness will probably make us all miserable. Um, and, and so, you know, again, when we think about utilitarianism, doing those things that make us happy. Now, doing those things that cause us maybe the least pain, obedience, uh, so long as the probable mischiefs of obedience are less than the probable mischiefs of resistance. So again, think about the mischiefs. Now, my taking other people's things is mischief, clearly, um, but it makes me happy. And so, but if you look at the sound happiness of our mischiefs, then maybe 
utilitarianism would say, taking other people's or pursuing my own happiness um, in a community of people who are pursuing happiness will be a terrible idea. Um, and so we need to think about, um, but also again, you know, the, the people whose stuff is taken, how do they feel? Are they happy? Are they going to do? So utilitarianism can lead us down a path that maybe nobody wants to, um, to go. But also utilitarianism talks about happiness. Um, but happiness is often like that whole hospital visit where you know you asked how much pain you're feeling and my one, I can't stand pain, you know. So if if I go to hospital, I will always probably say seven to nine or ten, because I, that's how I perceive it. But you know. Maybe that's not, maybe other people would be like, oh, that's like a four, maybe. Um, and so we don't know what the standards of happiness of other people are. And so we can't use utilitarianism to suggest that pursuit of happiness is for everyone, because some people be very strange with their pursuits of happiness. Um, yeah, so think about simple things like, music people enjoy or um, things people do or um, you know so it's it's um, utilitarianism can be very personal um, and I, I don't know that necessary constructing society based on personal preferences um, is going to make for a happy community because you might have some person who decides that chopping off right arms might be a thing. Yeah, so, so back to Bentham, we should, we should obey our rulers, caveats, as long as the benefits of doing so outweigh the costs and not just to ourselves. Um, we should obey our rulers if my obedience will lead to greater happiness of society than my disobedience. Um, so, you know, think about things like uh, wrong way crashes or, you know, those kinds of things. And um, while it may make me happy, how many other people is it going to? Or think about uh, most recently the Colorado um, club shooting. It may be made one person happy, but think about how many families. So the pursuit of util utilitarian um, whether it's dealing with society or obedience to our rulers. Now, again, um, caution, Germany, um, should we obey our rulers? Um, so, or should we have a lawbreaker's charter? Um, because if my own happiness is part of the general happiness and stealing a book from a large bookshop gives me happiness, then it would appear that if I stole a book, would I have an obligation to steal? Um, yeah. So if people may have stuff, but again, you know, there's these questions of um, justice and, and um, fairness and those kinds of things. Uh, but if taking your stuff gives me more happiness than it gives you sadness, if me taking your stuff gives me more happiness than it gives you sadness, even though we don't have a standard for how much sad you feel versus how happy I feel, um, then in theory, that gives me the right to take your, your stuff in. Maybe that's good for society. So utilitarianism can lead people to some really dark um, holes that maybe, um, yeah. So the, the utilitarian defense of the state, um, according to Bentham, um, suggests that laws should be passed if and only if they contribute to more happiness than any competing law or the absence of any law would do. But again, we still run into that question of how do you measure average happiness? Um, yeah, how do you do that? 
that laws should be obeyed because they are laws. Um, and because disobedience means punishment and should only be disobeyed to avoid disaster. Now, they, they, I'm sure we have maybe run into um, laws and other um, I'm trying to use a different word for laws, conditions or um, expectations and, and you're thinking why, but why? Um, so law should be obeyed because they are laws and will be obeyed because disobedience means punishment, but also, you know, if you're driving while black or you're doing living while black and that could be a terrible thing, yes, we should obey them to avoid disaster. Even though some days you're like, this makes no sense whatsoever, but to somebody it made sense, maybe. Um, law should be repealed and replaced if they fail to serve the proper utilitarian function. Um, so one of the justifications of the of this of the state um, from a utilitarian perspective is that the state is better than the state of nature. But again, remember, we have never seen the state of nature. The morally based society is, in one, is one in which happiness is maximized. Um, so happiness may be maximized, but the, I have always struggled with the question of, does everyone know everything there is to know about their society and options that are there. Um, but also, can anyone exercise them? So think about um, the protests going on in Iran about the hijab um, and whether, you know, so is happiness for the male-dominated society necessary happiness for the women? And is the society less happy if they cannot decide if they should wear or not the um, hijab. And the state um, promotes happiness better than the state of nature. Yes, except we've never seen the state of nature. The state and the state of nature are the only alternatives we have. Really? Are they? I don't know. Uh, we have a moral duty to bring about and support the state. So nice utilitarianism has cast um, support of the state and creating a state as a moral duty. Um, so this, this is a bit of uh, challenges with uh, utilitarianism. Now, there is um, what is often called the scapegoat um, objection. So the utilitarian morality has morally unacceptable, um, morally unacceptable consequences. So for example, if, and I think we briefly mentioned this, um, if we are looking maybe at Okay, we're back. Sorry about that. I wanted to see what this uh, link was. Um, but so utilitarian morality um, or the scapegoat objection has morally unacceptable consequences and permits or requires grave injustices. So if we, if the German society was happier 
obeying Hitler's laws as insane as perhaps they were. They were insane. Um, does, does that then permit those kinds of grave injustices? And it would seem that utilitarianism would suggest yes. Now, so rural utilitarianism, on the other hand, um, is used to sort of think about um, happiness. And so the, the idea that we should never make a rule um, that does not maximize happiness for the greatest number. But, so again, if you think about um, the, it is estimated that the total number of Africans who are sold in the Americas as slaves is 600,000. Um, so if you think about things like um, the, the three-fifths compromise, those are those were terrible, morally objectionable, horrible, insanely crazy, unacceptable laws. But if you are enslaving people and it's max, it's it's maximizing happiness for a greatest number, certainly you know uh, before 1619, it it wasn't maybe super objectionable and there aren't very many unhappy people about slavery um you know so so there's that question of can we does utilitarianism facilitate maybe in rather unusual ways scapegoating rape murder or um you know whole groups being selected for um, certain um, terrible outcomes. So again, you know, the, the, the practice of slavery. Um, and, and again, we, we see how majorities can make rules that oppress or disenfranchise or murder one group or another. But it, you know, as to the extent that you're saying that never make a rule that does not maximize happiness for the great no, greatest number. Um, if you are making rules in Nazi Germany that say take Jews and communists and um, hippies and blacks and other people to um, to ghettos and, and other places, even though we don't necessarily know we haven't measured the happiness of the but when Germany invaded the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union, uh, Germany deported Russians to work as house help in Germany. And so I, I would think that if you did not, if you did not care to have Russian workers in your house, you, there wouldn't have been deportations because otherwise what do you do with them? And so it, it seems paradoxically that for example, the, the, the slavery or the Jewish um, extermination stemmed from rules that didn't quite avoid or didn't meet rural utilitarianism. Not that rules that do not maximize happiness for the greatest number were made. Um, yeah, but it, it is true actually, and especially if you think about Jim Crow, in America, um, that um, that groups can make rules that oppress, disenfranchise, or murder another group. Um, yeah. So you know, sort of think about. Um, like if you think about the Fugitive Slave Act, um, the slave hunting patrols, um, and especially if you think about, well, you know, in return, the, this, the fugitive slaves or, so, so again, when, when you think about large malicious groups, they will probably always define what murder is. I mean, what murder is right or wrong. So um, for example, lynching. Um, till has just come out. And so when you think about these kinds of um, concepts and, and, and the application, we, we, we see how troubling 
um, some of these, I think, um, rules, utilitarian rules can be. So I am going to probably maybe not go through this um, step by step. But again, remember, utilitarianism suggests maximizing, maximizing the greatest happiness for the greatest number in society. Um, but also there's the question of socialization, how we socialized to think about happiness. And I think uh, utilitarianism doesn't really deal with this. So the state that yields more happiness than any other alternative more than in its absence. Um, and we are required to protect and to establish the state and protect it when we've established it. Now, again, as I mentioned, how do we measure utility? How do we measure happiness? Um, you know, but again, how many psychopaths are in the society? If breaking the law makes me happier than it makes you sad, then maybe I, we sh and if there's enough of us, we should maybe, um, yeah. So indirect ut utilitarianism or rural utilitarianism, which um, in theory on the whole promote happiness in the world, but again, social, um, how do we define? Um, so think about um, something like, um, I think there are rules that are, well, they're good for humanity. They, they generalize and don't leave exceptions. I am going to use a terrible, maybe not a terrible example, but if you've ever been, if you've ever been driving on an interstate, I'm going to pick 58 because you know, you know about it. And there's no car in front of you or behind you. If you are going, I think the speed limit is 55. If you are going 65, would that really harm anyone? And should we leave open the suggestions, suggestion that people can actually determine what is in the public interest um, so that maybe we reduce lawbreakers? But also if you're trying to, so until maybe not too long ago, I, it was my understanding that um, maybe Texas or Montana do not have speed limits. Now, of course, you know, there are people who might flip cars going 150 around a corner, which is not a great thing to do. But um, so are there enough opportunities for rule breakers to maybe break the rules? Like if you want to speed, maybe or drive NASCAR or, you know, those kinds of things. Uh, but also, you know, if you think about the autobahn and the speed, no speed limits in Germany, um, this, this, this can get to be um, moral hazards. Um, yeah. Now, this, uh, what is known as the moral imperative or the categorical imperative. Um, and this is an unconditional obligation which is binding in all circumstances and not dependent on a person's inclination or purpose. Now, assuming that all human beings were decent people who did not murder other people, we could come up with a categorical imperative that says we shall not murder anyone. Um, so then it would be the case that nobody would need to murder anyone. Um, yeah. So secondly, thinking about um, unjust laws or <laughs> rulings in legal cases. Um, so I wanted to think of, for example, the um, um, the Dred Scott case. Think about unjust laws uh, or rulings. So the the ruling in 1856 suggested that African Americans were not citizens and therefore had no standing to sue um, 
for freedom and those kinds of things. And this is the Supreme Court, which is in theory the, the highest court in the US and therefore maybe represents the majority view. Um, and so, you know, it, it seems that some injustices can be endorsed and, you know, again, Jennings 1896 um, ruled separate was separate, but unequal was not unconstitutional. Um, and so this, this a question of justice in a legitimate state. Can you have unjust rulings that make the majority happy? Clearly, these were making the majority happy. Well, aren't they? Um, yeah. But so think of um, you know justice in a in a um, legitimate state. Um, the happiness for the majority, maximizing happiness within the state. So um, after 9-11, quite a number of uh, Sikhs were attacked. Sikhs are a religious group from India that often wears turbans. Now, um, but this was not just after 9-11, there was actually a more recent, maybe 2017 attack in the, the person who, uh, who said, who did the attack said he thought that individuals are from Iran, but they were actually Indian. Uh, the Central Park Five, who were adjudicated to be guilty, even though there was lacking evidence, and a certain president has. So you you can make people happy. You can make the majority happy. You can arrest, you know, people for being allegedly doing certain things. You can. Um, make Americans happy by incarcerating Japanese Americans during the war, um, you know, Tulsa massacres and supporting those kinds of things. But, um, you know, the, this stands against justice. And, and if you're going to have a state where you please people more than you attain justice, I think this is a recipe for um, a terrible outcome. So we we find the question of the, the dilemma of the greatest good for the most people. But should we be aiming for the greatest good for the most people or should we be aiming for justice? Um, So the, the moral, I think the, the dilemma of the greatest good represented here is, is good food for thought. Um, a hypothetical scenario in which there are five patients, each of whom will soon die unless they receive an appropriate transplanted organ, a heart, two kidneys, a liver, and lungs. A healthy patient, Chuck, comes into the hospital for a routine checkup and the doctor finds that Chuck is a perfect match for as a donor for all five patients. Should the doctor kill Chuck and use his organs to save the five others? So is it morally acceptable to kill one person to save five? Mm. I don't know, what do you think? Um, so then we sort of <laughs> think of the principle of fairness. Um, So <clears throat> what is fairness um, and how many people can arrive at what can what is considered fair? Would all people find fairness to be the same thing? Um, and you know, so when you when you begin to think about these moral equivalencies, the principles of fairness, um, you know, we, we do get into the weeds of morality, justice, happiness for the most, utilitarianism. Yeah, this is, um, but it's, I think, useful to reflect on where we are so far. So our consent to be governed is implied. We enjoy the benefits provided by the state. We should accept the burdens imposed by the state. And these include, for example, obeying the laws, contributing to taxes, engaging in defense, 
and so our both our participation and expectation of being treated fairly by government authorities within the context of the state um, is um, is expected of us because we have given tacit consent. Um, and so the theory is that if you reap burdens of the state, you should share in uh, the burdens of the state whether it's fighting or doing those kinds of things. We reap benefits of the state because we live in a well-organized society that is governed by private property rules um, and personal security. These are critical to um, any state. Now, we want to think that um, we are rational human beings, and, and this is part of the utilitarian arguments of what makes you happy may not make other people happy. I think we briefly mentioned this um, um, rational choice theory, what makes more sense or the choice that you would make and whether it is the most beneficial to you at that particular point. And we agree that it is not always the most beneficial. Um, but um, sometimes we don't pursue either what's good for society or the long-term benefits. And so um, rational choice in theory should lead us to what is the most, the best or the most beneficial to us. Um, but we also mentioned that uh, the introduction of prisoner's dilemma. So if you're pursuing something that is good for you, including you know, your own happiness, then in theory, you might hurt other people. Um, and so as human beings, we are unable to um, temper our patience for long-term benefits and we are more likely to pursue short-term benefits which is not um, necessarily a great thing and so you know going back to the state and thinking about what the state is and how it's administered and its obligations and our obligations to it um, and so thinking about what Hume thinks about justice the state laws enforcement punishment and so on we see, we see him suggesting systems of civil magistrates who regulate conduct between us or make laws, and, um, but also, you know, urges, uh, suggests that obedience is in our long-term strategy, um, even though it's in our short-term interest, so we avoid punishment. But, you know, if you, like, if you think about people who, might occupy certain things, uh, places. I'm thinking of the recently hired special counsel. You you hear the record of um, predictability of doing certain things. Um, so, you know, Hume bases his suggestion um, for the state and government on maybe advantages of government in our acceptance of it. So we, we this is, this moves out from the utilitarian argument um, because it's, it's not even thinking about the morally acceptable thing to do or the, the greatest happiness, but sort of like the advantages of government and now the difference is that we might um, we might see the advantages of government even though we we don't think morally we are obligated to obey um, those because again if you if you think about um, a terrible maybe role reversal if you have a community that actually this is a very good example of um, society that was ruled by minorities actually um, Syria the Alawites or Iraq the the Sunnis so if you have they had the power and they were ruling 
but then you know changes made the shias the majority and so a fair government it wouldn't matter who is a majority it would matter that we see the advantages of government because it's treating people um, the same way so it's not a question of a moral obligation of moral obligation to obey the law it's um it's our duty because we also see the advantages it's 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 um meeting the political burdens and and benefits of um um of now of course there's the other um counterpoint that you know unsolicited benefits create no obligations to reciprocate and so um you know for example you most people may not have needed the money the government distributed during covid um but you know sometimes it's sort of like yeah it's it's money now if you had to pay it back you might be like oh, I don't, mm, mm, yeah, yeah, yeah didn't need it um or then if you had to do certain things but again if you if you think about um our membership of certain societies i'm going to move quickly here to south korea so south korean young men are required to i don't know if young women are required to uh, serve in the military for at least one to three years and so you can be exempted by doing something important like um, this gentleman who was playing um, soccer for Manchester United. Um, and so he was exempted. BTS, I believe, they have been exempted from this because of their global. And so, you know, but um, recently I read that they were going to fulfill their obligations. And so it's not that you can't like move to a different country and, and avoid those benefits because you know well south korea is important for bts i think their global presence is more um and so to think that maybe they should be doing military service and not entertaining the world i don't know how we um uh, yeah so you know there are those kinds of decisions um that people always make about obligations versus um, um the burdens versus the benefits um but again, Hume looks at um, the advantages of government and our acceptance to it um, more than, yeah. So now the dilemma then becomes, you know, because we are members of society and we consent to be governed, even though not explicitly, uh, what about those burdens that we disagree with? So if you disagreed with the US invasion of Iraq or Afghanistan, um, what kinds of obligation does that open you up to and how do you express those obligations? Um, and, and this brings up the question of, can you be supplied with goods you have no desire for and be made to pay for the same goods? Um, like if um, a city builds a road or a stadium and then increases taxes, should you be obligated to pay for those things? Now, the, most people will probably not even know that they are doing that, but also sometimes um, we do have free riders who will benefit from those things. And I wonder if it's uh, if it just, you know, um, now, the, the principle of fairness would say it's unfair to accept the benefits and refuse to pay. Um, but is there a difference between accepted benefits and received benefits? Um, but again, you know, should people residing in a state's territory, um, country's territory, have no obligations? But also the question then is, how do we separate the obligations that they are obliged to and the obligations they can choose to have? Now, one of those ways is, for example, uh, the US, even though it has a selective service system, does not, um, it does not um, require military service. Um, so, it does unless it's mobilizing people. And so the 
some people have maybe more political obligations, including maybe people who run for office, um, than people who hold jobs and pay taxes and you know do those kinds of things. But um, but there are still people who reside in territories, but maybe not have those political obligations like jury duty or uh, voting, but they still reside within the um, the territory. So, you know, again, there are many dilemmas in, in these questions. And, and I think as you go through this, you're going to see um, the maybe the challenge of um, of thinking through states and how they are organized, how they are ruled, the obligations that we have to the states, the obligations that states have to us. Uh, but the next um, item that we're going to be looking into, I don't know how much we're going to get um, through this, is um, who governs the state and, and what is their, yeah, what is their qualifications or um, what is their standing to rule um, states? How do they get to this position? Who appoints them? What is the best form of government? Um, and so that is what we ought to be looking in the next section of this. And so we have come to the um, end of this uh, recording. Your thoughts? Have a great, wonderful,